Hello, and welcome to another fully live Q&A episode of Hacking with Friends. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher at Veronis, and today, per usual, we have my good friend and fellow hacker Alex here to help answer your hacking-related questions. So we've also been doing some, you know, security research uh, for the last week. So we're going to go over a little bit about what we've been up to as well, just in case you guys have any questions about that. So per usual, Alex, uh, thanks for being here. And yeah, what are you uh, up to this week? Not a lot of security, but a lot of uh, cat-themed um, <laughs> shenanigans of, short, of sorts. Um, now that we've finally pushed out, like, the, um, a working binary for the rubber nugget, which has taken up a lot of my time. I've been able to do a lot of stuff that I have sort of put on the backlog of maintenance for this project. So I've been working on stuff like putting up a proper documentation site and learning a lot about static site generators and doing a lot more infrastructure stuff with GitHub, like learning how to use like continuous integration and some other stuff so we have the proper infrastructure um, for documentation that hopefully some of you guys might be able to contribute to. Um, if you actually want to check that out, I have a prototype pulled up here of what that's going to look like. So I created this mock-up in Bootstrap that I've been working on, um, and the underlying mechanism for this static site generator is using a thing called Hugo. Mm -hmm. So it should be relatively easy for us to merge over some of our existing documentation. Like, for example, I started writing um, documentation for the rubber nuggets. Or I guess I don't have that pulled up, <laughs> <laughs> which is a humiliating defeat. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it makes it really easy for us to just um, create a template like this and then just drop in existing text in Markdown. So it should be relatively easy for us to put all of our resources in one place and hopefully have better documentation for some of the existing Wi-Fi Nugget projects we've been working on. Like, for example, some of the one-off stuff like the SSDP project that you are working on, um, the Nugget Invader, and various other side projects, so it's easier for you guys to follow along. So yeah, on top of that, I've also been working on some new designs. So for instance, I've been working on this SnapFit case design for the Wi-Fi Nugget, which you oh, can't really see. That's so but cool. But I'm actually going to pull I it up that, on actually. my Twitter in just a second. Yeah, so one of the issues... Oh, one are, sec. Just, uh, just also checking, hello to everybody in the chat, and hopefully the volume's a little bit better. Some people were saying it was a bit quiet, so if it's if it's still too quiet, please let us know. And hello to everyone, uh, Zam and uh, James and everybody else. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, so one of the um, biggest feedback points we got on the Wi-Fi Nugget design was that a lot of people um, noticed that their cases would eventually become loose after a while, and this could cause potential damage to the screen or other components that are... You could bust facing. your nug, which was yeah, you could. which is bad, because the screen is very nugs. fragile. And once it's busted, it doesn't work so good. Nugget's also very emotionally fragile, so make sure you're taking proper care of it and providing Reinforce it every proper day. maintenance. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I've been working on this little snap fit design that hopefully keeps it in place a little bit better. You can see we started adding these bezels and we're messing around with different design iterations. So that way it's a little more stable, secure, and well protected. So on top of this case design, we've also come back around, ah, oh, dang, I didn't get to tweet about it yet, but we also came back around to the SMD version of the Nugget. Mm. Um, it's so Which small. we're hoping to get prototypes for in the near future. Yeah, it's about, Volumetrically, it's about a quarter of the size of the current nugget we have. Do you have a full-size nugget uh, for, yes, for scale? Do. Of course I do. I yeah. always do. You can actually see one on my screen there. It's a black and white nugget that we made. A special request. But yeah, um, if you want to switch over to the camera real quick, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, so these so are actually small. yeah these are the current nuggets that we're shipping out. These are like the Game Boy-esque nugget with the um, cute color-changing purple case and orange button. But um, the SMD nugget will be about... This small, it's like completely surface mount, it's very flat and flush, and also easier to produce since um, due to the SMD design, machines can pick and place it better, and it's a whole lot easier to get these components in bulk. So well, it was, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see about that with a current component shortage. But yeah, we're making a lot of design improvements both to our um, documentation as well as hardware designs, case designs, and stuff like that. Oh yeah, and then on top of all of that, I've also been messing around with the Wi-Fi Pineapple mm. since Hack5 just released, I think, um, the RC2 firmware 2.0 software or something like that. Um, so I have been looking specifically at using the Pine AP module on the web interface, which is really cool since that lets you gather reconnaissance on networks that devices have seen before via probe requests. So the Pine AP interface is designed to let you 
basically see what networks other devices have um, connected to before, gather a list of those, and then use those in order to spoof them to create fake networks, which is called a karma attack. So I've been learning a little bit about that, and I will hopefully be able to demo that in an upcoming video. Oh yeah, very yeah. upcoming. <laughs> so yeah, if you want to learn more, a little hint, you could probably just stay tuned until around uh, uh, Thursday, and you might uh, see a new Hack 5 video dropped uh, about how to do that on uh, the Wi-Fi Pineapple. Yeah, there's awesome. a whole lot of really cool features on the Wi-Fi Pineapple, and the workflow makes it really easy to figure out how to do that. Everything's there basically like step-by-step step through each different part of the menu interface, and the layout is actually fairly intuitive. So I enjoyed working with it. Yeah, and it's cool to see. I think we had a live stream with uh, a bunch of people who worked on the Wi-Fi Pineapple update, including Darren. And then also we uh, had, I think Glitch just came out with something on the Hack5 channel about attaching LTE, yeah, that was which really is cool. also super cool. So we're going to be hitting the Wi-Fi Pineapple three times in a row, uh, which is really awesome considering it has new capabilities that you might not be aware of. So definitely check that out if you haven't seen it before. And yeah. also somebody in the chat asked, do you use stimulants? We would never use stimulants. What a ridiculous <laughs> thing to suggest. Is this paid product placement? Excuse me, but yeah, no. Um, I don't know what you're talking about. Ooh, someone says, Nugget Case could use a keychain option to make it look more like a toy. Okay, well, this is the thing. I, sorry, this is, this is my fight. I have been saying that we need to be able to attach phone bling slash candy to this design since the beginning, and yet it's fallen behind, and it just hasn't hey. been implemented. <laughs> I don't know why. So I've been, I agree with you. You should be able to have tassels, candy, whatever you want on it. I think it would really spice up the entire design. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, with the new, well, like with the current design we have here, this one's becoming a little cuter. I do like the color changing and stuff like that, but I want to make this new iteration with the real tiny nugget a lot more gamified. I think we could do that. Yeah, and oh, just so that I'm also clear about the, the coolness of this new case design. So the previous version of the Wi-Fi Nugget case would uh, just was friction fit, so it would come apart, and eventually the nugget, the, the screen would break. This new version has little tabs on the oh, end. Oh, that one actually sucks. Oh, it doesn't. That was the first iteration it, of the yeah, yeah. that I created. So the, the, the correct version, the right prototype, has little tabs on the top and bottom, so it locks in place. And that shouldn't get weaker with time. It should always lock it into place, protect the screen, and do a better job. So we listened to a bunch of feedback we got from people uh, who tried out our product, and then we're like, hey, the screen breaks. Uh, you should fix that. So yeah. this should make it so the screen, the screen is a lot more protected. And we will make these files available. So if you have access to a 3D printer, you can make your own. You can update it, um, which is what we like to do. So a um, little patch, physical patch for the Wi-Fi Nugget to improve screen durability. Uh, it's cool being able to make iterations both with the shape of the product and then also what the software does every week. Yeah, um, another thing I was like briefly looking into for a while was also different materials we could use, like um, hmm. getting custom injection molded cases or like nice, sexy acrylic cases for the <laughs> Nugget or something like that. But yeah, I'm really excited to see what we can do with the SMD Nugget since there's a lot of possibilities and unhindered design. Um, choices. Because with using the modules, you don't get a lot of choice that was already um, put into that design from the manufacturer of those models. But now that we have complete control of what we're doing with the microcontroller, we just have a lot more unfettered ability to add new features, breakouts, sensors, and modules, and stuff like that in a much more compact form factor. So another thing that you haven't mentioned um, yet is Ooh. the fact that we released a new binary for the Wi-Fi Nugget. I did. OK, all right. But well, I didn't point to it. But if you already have a Wi-Fi Nugget, if you've already picked up the S2 Wi-Fi Nugget, not the, not the D1 that uses the ESP8266, it needs to be the new kind of nice uh, S2 Wi-Fi Nugget that's based on the ESP32 S2, then you can use this awesome Arduino rubber nugget program that starts up, I would say, like like four times as fast as the CircuitPython version and is ready to go immediately. It is a totally redesigned interface and we're looking for feedback. Plus, uh, we will be giving out some prizes to people who submit bugs. So if you look over here at issues, if you go to, uh, so if you have a Wi-Fi Nugget, S2 Wi-Fi Nugget, you download this, you load it up, you try it and you find us a bug, go ahead and drop it here. And you can see that most of the bugs are me, uh, but we do have some closed ones that were someone else. And yeah, this yeah. person is in the running to receive a Hack5 gift card as well as some awesome prizes. So. Uh, we're going to be running this for a while, uh, and we'd like as many people to give us feedback on this 
new tool. Again, this is designed <clears throat> to take existing Ducky scripts and allow you to not only see how they're executing by using the screen, it literally shows you as the payload's executing, but be able to select any one of 36 payloads in three button presses or less. Plus, it also comes with a Wi-Fi interface that allows you to connect and execute attacks. And if you don't have a Wi-Fi nugget, you can go to <clears throat> Alex. You can go to wi-fi nugget.com. Um, I hope that website's up. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually go to hackcat.com just to be safe, which is H-A-K-C-A-T.com. All right, so we also have a question, again, what is the status of the Nullbyte channel? So the Nullbyte channel is owned by a company called Wonder How To, uh, not me. So because they own this and I don't, um, somebody else is trying to buy it or bought it and has no idea what they want to do with Nullbyte, so it's sitting there dead. Um, I haven't contributed a Nullbyte in probably a year and a half, two years, maybe two years. So it's kind of wild because they had such a large stockpile of content that nobody really knew that we'd stop they'd stop buying content from us for like a good seven, eight months after they just kind of shut everything down. So um, yeah, like uh, I know that um, we actually, Veronis have like tried to purchase that channel so we can keep making new content and they wanted just like kind of a ludicrous amount of money. And then also I know that um, our friend Marcus also attempted to purchase the Nullbyte channel and they still wanted a ludicrous amount of money for content that's getting older and older and less relevant mm -hmm. every day. So unless that stuff is refreshed, I don't really see the value in it, but these people really think they're holding on to something special with like three years of my work. So kind of sad, you know, I miss the Nullbyte community and honestly, um, those discussions get rowdy in the comments sometimes and I'm, I'm here for it, I like it. Um, but we have our own taste of that here though. Yeah, so definitely. The Hack 5 channel. Definitely, so we like our home at the Hack 5 channel, but of course we do miss Nullbyte. But you know, Nullbyte, the website was started even way before I created the YouTube channel. So while I was the one who was responsible for the YouTube channel, um, somebody else owned the website and was paying us, not that much, but some, uh, to produce those videos back then. So. Unfortunately, it's still kind of deadlocked, but hey, we're here and we produce content all the time on Hack5, so you can stay tuned here if you want to see our newest content. Although, yeah, I wish someday we would get the uh, the access back to, to Nullbyte. Someone points out, as he gulps his double shot, it's actually a triple this shot. This is a triple Cody shot because I'm, I'm having a bad day. <laughs> I need to wake up. So um, what have you been up to this week? Um, okay, this week I've been up to a bunch of stuff. Uh, let's see, we released our video uh, and got some feedback last week. Uh, I don't think we covered this on the Q&A. So a bunch of the questions we're going to be covering today oh, are okay. from um, our watch hackers destroy industrial systems with code. So we, uh, well, Alex set up a little industrial system and I had to find a way to destroy it. And we talked about the way that hackers attack industrial systems like this and how this was kind of similar to a very famous SCADA attack against uh, Iranian centrifuges. So this was obviously not designed to be super realistic, but we were able to really physically destroy a device that normally ran within a safe range by uh, doing something that's actually a pretty common mistake that a lot of different web interfaces will do. So because a lot of these utilities are connected to the internet, we wanted to do something that just shows a little bit about how hackers are able to actually destroy systems. In this place, uh, in this case, a, a, a kind of nonsense device, but it's notable that um, Many Michaels were harmed in the production of this video. Uh, yeah, as you, if we switch over to my screen, as you can see, um, there's definitely something going on at this PowerPoint plant that all these Michaels are working at. And unfortunately, oh, many of them Michaels. meet an unfortunate end. Oh, there, 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 there they are. are, yeah. Yeah, so if you haven't seen this video already, it has 21,000 views. It's only been up since, I think, like uh, Thursday of last week. So if you want to see the exciting conclusion to this, hint, many Michaels are harmed, then please make sure to check this out and give us some feedback. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and start taking some questions, both from the channel and also from the audience live. Alex, what's the first one? Yeah, so first off, people were concerned about um, some of the, I wouldn't say actors, these were actually, these weren't paid actors. These were real these were, Michaels. Yeah, these were real people. Yeah. Um, so how many were injured in the segment, and did that engineering guy really die? Is he okay, okay? Let, let's see. All right, let's go through it really quick. What Whoa, oh, oh my no, gosh. Right. Oh, there's one Michael. Uh, okay, that's not a Michael. Um, that's an Ariza. Uh, there's, oh, a, there's a second Michael. So two. That, that actually, so between one to two Michaels were killed in the, in the making of, the, theoretical Michaels were killed in the making that's of this film. Great question. Yeah, safety is critical. But of course, this was set in the year, um, 2024 mm. so we do michael does have some time to reconcile with fate before uh he finds clones of himself working in a power plant in new jersey perhaps he'll meet bigfoot by then perhaps he will maybe that's where the clones come from yeah and someone also says 
I'm not sure if Cody is actually old enough to know anything about mall wear. Big hair and crazy clothes. Okay, so we got <laughs> a bunch of feedback from the pronunciation of nuclear and malware. Um, so thank you very much to everyone who took the time to correct our pronunciation <laughs> on this exhausting to produce video. All right, next. Hey, at least no one has called me out for Azure and, uh, God, what was the it other makes one? It, it makes Azure oh, sound like a, a fancy soup. Yeah, I, I would eat that. Yeah, sounds nice. <laughs> Okay, finally a legit question. Oh no, just a random comment. I worked in a very high profile US manufacturing company for years um, and they can attest to the fact that they are no more secure now than 20 years ago, which is scary. Shodan, is, um, Shodan can easily be used to workstations, to PLCs, systems not configured correctly where you can change settings and values on coils. It's all pretty simple. Kansas City is one of the worst by international systems or <laughs> even worse. Yeah. Um, so one thing that was interesting that we learned from the guest that we had on is that um, so our the person we interviewed was from uh, Verona's, but previously they had, they had worked at a like manufacturing place and they had these systems that were like certified in a certain way and this was for like insurance standards, safety standards, like all this stuff where the second they change anything and this could be like legacy software running with known bugs and problems and all sorts of issues, the second that they actually like change something that changes the state of their certification and they can get in all sorts of trouble. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting here is like, it can actually be the case where they know they have critical problems in these systems and for money reasons, they will just let these systems that are super, super out of date just persist for a very long time. And like, that's just, you know, the, the institution is kind of pressuring them to stay this way because it's the only certified way of running these machines. Certified doesn't mean anything when it comes to security, I suppose. It does when it comes to insurance. Yeah. And if something were to happen and there was like a fire in your building or something and it was found that like these systems had been updated with like unknown software and they were out of specification, then suddenly you're, you are the one who's responsible for the cost of all that. So like, you know, there's big consequences for some of these businesses like changing um, one of these systems that is like kind of set in stone. And unfortunately, it makes them incredibly vulnerable um, when these systems are then subsequently connected to the internet or someone like puts up a firewall, but then the firewall is vulnerable for, uh, you know, to log for J. Whoops, like Ooh. that's not good. So um, yeah, they, there's a lot of problems at an institutional level when it comes to these sorts of businesses being kind of incentivized to keep their stuff in an, a configuration that might not be secure, but is tested. And for insurance companies, that can be what really matters. It, it really pays to be complacent about security, but in a bad way. If you leave open those default credentials, you know, someone might get access to your nuclear centrifuge and destroy everything, which wouldn't be good. Oh yes, it would have been. And somebody else was asking, wait, which ESP32? Oh, Cherry, I just ordered one S2. Yeah, so um, the uh, microcontroller that we are currently using for our HackHat project, the Wi-Fi Nugget, is the ESP32 S2. Of course, there's an ESP32 S3 that just, just came out that's very kind of like sexy and distracting because it has Bluetooth and is faster and has more power, but we're that's that's for the future. We're, we're with this ESP32 S2 right now and that's what matters. All right, what's up next? Uh, oh, someone says, Alex, what is the plugin you use on desktop that shows CPU, memory usage, etc.? I believe it's Conky, or is it Clonky? <laughs> um, oh no, it's Conky. So it's a software desktop system monitor for the X Windows system. Yeah, you can just install this over command line. I have this pulled up on my screen here. Um, I think you can just do like a sudo apt install to download this, but I actually don't have this on the current computer that I'm working on, but you guys might have seen this on some of my previous tutorials um, that I've done since this is Cody's computer and I broke my old one. But yeah, yeah this is a really nice, yeah, this is a nice little like widget. This. Oh my gosh, horrifying. Yeah, it's a nice little widget that just overlays random stats on your desktop. Um, yeah, and you can also modify it to, as you can see, do other stuff like show a current MP3 file playing, you can show your network speed or whatever the heck. I find it really useful. Mm. We have another question, Wi-Fi hacking question. Can we make a, ro and this actually came up for you, so I really like it. Um, can we make a rogue AP with the same WPA2 uh, like name, uh, with the same ESSID, without knowing the password of the real access point? So that when the victim tries to access the rogue AP, we get the password that we want. So the scenario here again is like you have a, like a client device that has the password to a network you want to break into. Uh, and what you want to do is find a way 
to use the client trying to connect your fake network that has the same name in order to try to get the password to this network you want in on. Um, so again, this could be a scenario where you're going to have very limited access to a site um, where you'll have to break into the Wi-Fi and already know the password in order to get away with some sneaky thing you need to do very quickly. Um, and in that case, you could just go after anybody who has access to the Wi-Fi password and use their device as a way of extracting a handshake. So the way that would work for a hacker is I would take something, maybe the Wi-Fi pineapple, for example, and I would create an access point that is the exact same type of security and the exact same name as the target access point. So if it was you know, test123, we'd create another uh, Wi-Fi network that has test123 as its name, but it would have a totally different password because we have no idea what the password actually is. Alex's phone, if he were the victim, would then see this and be like, oh, I recognize that, and attempt to connect, sending the first part of a handshake. But of course, it wouldn't get a correct handshake back, so it would then kind of cancel out the transaction and no connection would be made. So there's no point at which you get a plain text handshake or a plain text password. It's not just given to you. You get a handshake that is a hashed version of the password, which means brute forcing. You only so, get like one half of the message, right? Exactly. You're using that method, yeah. Yeah, so there's a second caveat here, which is exactly that, and that because you're only getting one half the message, in traditional Wi-Fi cracking, we're able to compare our proposed you know, password against both the client and the server side. So in this case, if we're able to check it on both side, we know that we got the right password because both of them match. In this case, some random person, say Michael over there, could be trying to connect to this access point because he wants free Wi-Fi and he's just guessing some password. And we would be totally unable to distinguish the difference between the real password and a password that somebody nearby was guessing. Of course, like, what are the odds that some random person would just start spamming random passwords on a network that's specifically crafted to look like one that only certain people have, have had access to before, is the question. Um, if it looks too generic, then the odds actually might be super likely. So uh, this technique does have some limitations because you might end up cracking a gibberish password that somebody just punches in while trying to connect to something that they just want to see if they can connect to. So um, Alex and I try gibberish Wi-Fi passwords all the time to see if it happens to be the phone number of the restaurant or the address of the restaurant when we're just sitting there waiting for food. So it does happen, and if you're trying to use this half handshake capture method, then you could fall prey to getting a, a person guessing the Wi-Fi password, and then you waste all your time cracking a password that does literally nothing. So that is a notable uh, kind of precaution about the half handshake method, but you can check out my very popular video on Hack5 about how to capture a half handshake if you want to learn more about this method. An alternative, alternative to this would also be Wi-Fi phishing, and you can do this on a microcontroller as we've demonstrated in some different ways. Uh, and this would involve popping up a Wi-Fi network that looks the same but doesn't have a password while simultaneously deauthenticating um, the target network. And that would cause them to not be able to use their internet. They would see a network with the same name open. They would connect to it confused, and it would say, the router's updating. Please put in your password to allow the update. As soon as they do that, then boom, we have the plain text password. So that's the way we actually can, with no cracking, get a plain text password. But of course, it's still vulnerable to the same problem where we can't immediately authenticate it. So like, you know, unless we attempt to immediately try to connect to their Wi-Fi network with those credentials they supplied, there's not really a good way for us to make sure that the password they give us in this phishing attack, which it really is just Wi-Fi social engineering or Wi-Fi phishing, is valid. So really good question. There was a fork of Wi-Fi Fisher, which is one of the most popular tools for doing that, that actually checks and tries to validate after it receives the plain text password whether or not it can authenticate to the network. If not, it continues to like deauth them until they input the right one in the case that they provide like a misspelled password or they make a typo or something, which I thought was really cool. Someone says, why are all SDRs ridiculously expensive? Does anyone have like an SDR mini that I can buy? Actually, the, um, the flagship RTL SDR, just like the regular gray one, I know we have one like somewhere, it's usually on these tables, is pretty cheap. You can get them for like $30, I think. Oh yeah. They, yeah. The funny thing about them is when they get hot, they drift. So the frequency will go <laughs> oh, up sure. or down, and that's just because you get what you pay for. Yeah. You can slap a bunch of heat sinks on them though, I've seen that. Mm. And there is a reason why they're enclosed in all metal, because they do get hot as hell. <laughs> Yeah, those seem to be pretty decent for like sub gigahertz hacking. I think it goes up to like one point something megahertz. I'm not sure, but I find those pretty decent mm. for the price range. Um, so someone says, I apologize for giving you sort of a hard time in the previous video. 
I was frustrated. I needed to take a step uh, back and address the issue. Th so thank you for being so respectful. Yeah, uh, so that's actually a good opportunity to talk about like the feedback we get on YouTube because it is all over the place. Sometimes we'll release a video and we'll get feedback that's just like, you really like put extra energy into that and I can, you know, appreciate that but this part of the video was awkward or weird or whatever. And that, th that is like our favorite type of feedback because it lets us know if we tried something new, what parts of it worked and maybe what parts of it didn't work and don't need to come back. And that makes us, you know, feel like we're engaged with our community. We also get stuff that it's just like, why are you not Darren? <laughs> and that I, I, I don't know how to address that because I'm not Darren, nor will I ever be Darren. Darren doesn't even know how to answer that question. I know, he had I know. an identity crisis. Yeah, and uh, and other people are just like, I miss the old half five. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm also not able to help you with that because, like, as far as I know, Shannon is still on this channel every single week. So oh, are yeah. you just not like subscribed? Um, but so that kind of feedback less helpful. And then we also get feedback from people that seem like mad. Uh, and sometimes it's just like, I'm not gonna listen to anyone who doesn't know how to pronounce this word. I'm just like, we, we literally spent four days on this video trying to make it as funny and engaging as possible for a topic that's like, you know, kind of dry sometimes. Um, so like having somebody like, you know, just, we also used to have, uh, back when we had Nick on, who has like a great job, is going to great school, super talented, like it's just like volunteering his time to like help make edu educational content. People were like making fun of his appearance. <laughs> In, in like so a mean. really mean way. So like the fact that like we get con we get feedback all over the place, both from like straight up disrespectful and crazy to like really respectful and cool. Like, you know, we're, it's probably not the worst of what we've gotten. And at yeah. least if it's an attempt to be constructive and like let us know how we are, you know, interfacing with the community, that's something we really, really want to know about. And we can handle, you know, that was cringy. Like I didn't like the X, Y, Z, but I did like this. You know, that's fair, that's balanced, like that's cool. But if you just like straight up hate an episode or think that we did something wildly inappropriate, we dock someone or whatever, then like, please, you know, you can you can let us know. Like we're not gonna be shocked or sad about it. We don't only wanna hear good feedback. We just like, if it's just not constructive, then like I'm not going to expose the people who like worked really hard on it to just like mean comments that are like baseless. So like, that's yeah. really my line. It's just like, if someone is, ta is like, needs to see a therapist or take a step back and their comment is just like out of pocket. Like I'll just like try to be as like respectful as possible until they can take that moment and remember that they're talking to a person that does this like because I enjoy it. Like and if at any point I stop enjoying it, I just won't do it anymore. Yeah, if anything, we have like lots of discussions about like how to refine like the formulas for the videos that we put out and like what content people want to see. So if anything, the candid straightforward comments are accepted but like if you're just dumping on our content that's like kind of <laughs> unwelcome but we do appreciate we do appreciate the feedback about you know what's cringy what you guys want to see or don't want to see or what you feel like would need more elaboration or mm. what needs more technical detail or whatever we really appreciate that yeah and so far like just our one of our favorite episodes is the facial recognition episode like we're trying to make more episodes that are kind of like that because we thought that that one looked really nice and polished and really gave people a good understanding of you know what we want to show. So uh, if you have any feedback, if you have any episodes you really like, let us know because uh, we're actively, of course, always coming up with new ideas and we've got some really good ones coming up. Some of which I'm not sure will pass uh, the, <laughs> the PR review. Oh boy. Um, yeah, Tra tracking down intimate devices with Wi-Fi, maybe, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> um, oh gosh. Someone asked, what happened to the Null Byte channel? Just rewind like 10 minutes, you'll, you'll see it. Just we watch it. any live stream preceding this one <laughs> someone says do you like olive garden you know i like i like the free breadsticks this i usually a, get this full is off. a trap let's go to the next okay, question fine. <laughs> all right what's the best way to boost a mobile wi-fi signal i'm thinking a pineapple running from within a backpack hmm uh what do they mean by wife mobile wi-fi signal like um from their cell phone well uh so i'm assuming you mean like, like on the go. oh yeah like an on the go like uh, wi-fi signal so if you want like hmm. super high signal strength um, oh, someone says Pringle can. Yeah, I guess you could use something like a directional Wi-Fi antenna mm. to get better gain. Depends where the Wi-Fi signal is coming from that you're trying to get better gain on, but yeah. Yeah, so like if you wanted to get like really good overall coverage, you could just have a fat omnidirectional antenna, you know, that's like going through your backpack that's getting a giant donut of, of you know, what you want. If, however, you're going after like 
a really tall building, then maybe you want like a panel antenna that's in your backpack kind of tilted up. So as you walk around, it's scanning like the top floors or something like that. There's really a lot of different options you could do for like antenna to boost the signal. But yeah, I would say doing something uh, personally. I um, was poor for a long time. So using a, a Raspberry Pi is usually the way I would go. But I think that the, the pineapple is right now cheaper than a Raspberry Pi. Oh my gosh, yeah. So, I mean, at this point, you might as well use the pineapple, right? Oh yeah, I guess they're talking about like Wi-Fi extenders. I've used a Raspberry Pi before. This comes with host APD baked in, so you can technically use it as an extender. Actually, not technically. This thing has like all the functions of a router and runs like um, OpenWRT, so you could probably do that. Yeah, um, I, I would also just refer like back to like, I really like um, Alpha Wireless. Mm. Um, they have some really good like stuff that's like for like boats. That's like oh, water sure. resistant, like hu like huge, huge, great things. And then also they have a couple of the same models that have like LTE built in. So you can just turn it into a little mini router and it looks like the same kind of like, looks like a short lightsaber. Um, so it's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, they have like incredible range because again, they're meant for like boats and other stuff that's floating like a good way offshore and still needs to get a good signal from like, you know, potentially like up to a mile away. So yeah, really, really fun stuff over um, at Alpha Wireless. So people are discussing about common passwords. Phone number is a common one for Wi-Fi password cracking. Yeah, I actually made a custom script just for that because I found like phone numbers tend to work a lot, both for like businesses, but also people's personal Wi-Fi. So like one of my go-tos besides running default credentials against um, that are against general setups that are like my spectrum Wi-Fi, et cetera, um, would just be like passwords for the general region I'm in based off the area code. And I have a pretty good success rate with that. Oh, someone's coming for the tea. All right, um, what happened to Occupy the Web? So Occupy the Web was the former um, editor of Nullbyte immediately before I came and started the YouTube channel. So he was the one that wrote a lot of the older, now like legacy articles on Nullbyte that you'll see slowly decaying over time as the software that they're based on is updated over and over and over again. So um, I would say uh, Occupy the Web had some, let's say, friction between uh, the people who ran Wonder How To and they went their separate ways. And then upon the time of me uh, starting to write for Wonder How To, uh, made a lot of fun of my MacBook uh, computer and said that I couldn't possibly be good at my job because I have a uh, MacBook, uh, which was given to me for free. So that just means I'm a good social engineer as far as I'm concerned. Um, but yeah, so like we have basically the opposite teaching style. Like I like to admit the fact that I am limited in what I know, but I specialize in a couple of specific things that I'm really good at. So if you want to know Wi-Fi hacking, OSINT, and microcontrollers, like I'm your guy. Um, I am not the I'm not the master of all hacking, but um, that's kind of the the persona that Occupy the Web goes with. So because of the kind of like. I would call it a little bit of gatekeeping when it comes to making fun of people mm. for the operating system they use. Um, I just never, uh, and the fact that like they've never reached out to me or like said anything to me, like I've just kind of uh, been like good for you. Like I think they offer like courses or something, but yeah, just uh, used to be the editor of Nullbyte um, and wrote a bunch of articles there. But I never met the per the person, and like they go through a lot of trouble, like being like mysterious and like never showing their face. So like I've never invested the time in like trying to figure that situation out. So. That's all I know. That's that's Thanks. the whole drama. That's all I know. I'm just like amazed because nobody has asked that question before. So, thank you for surprising me. It's always <laughs> I always get a surprising question on this. All right. Uh, there's some questions about the pineapple, and I also see some stuff about the hack RF, which I know you started messing around with. But hmm. um, Pasha asks, best way to learn how to use the pineapple. That's gonna be you. You've been, uh, been at it. Yeah, I'm the new pineapple expert. Um, the new documentation is actually really slick um, that Hack5 is hosting. It's kind of obscure to find it, though. Let me see if I can find the reference. But the new um, Hack5 wiki page slash documentation page for the Wi-Fi Pineapple has a pretty straightforward and easy to follow um, documentation thing that walks you through like all of the modules and also gives you a basic overview of some of the Wi-Fi terminology and also um, some of the stuff you can do um, with those different modules, but I'm gonna hopefully be putting out some tutorial videos to give more in-depth insight to actually how to use those, but um, Yeah, I found some of the definitions for like the different types of AP modes the different types of filters you can apply and stuff like that um, Pretty useful. Let me see if I can find that wiki page though uh, Cody you seem to be pretty knowledgeable about crypt cryptography slash ciphers. I would hope so. I have a tattoo That's a cipher. It's like the, the going into the uh, crypto privacy village at DEF CON is like the one time I get to be cool 
and people don't assume that this is like a zodiac cipher thing. So yeah, no, I, I know a little bit about cryptography. Shoot your shot. What question you got? James says microcontrollers. Cody, Alex, and Andreas. Spice. That would be the best. Yeah, so if be you've great. never, so if you've it. ever taken an electronics class and been like, I wonder if I could do some like insert oh some crazy gosh. idea, you will after a little bit of googling inevitably end up on Andreas Spice's YouTube channel. This guy is just the like the the I'm not gonna say like the black hole. He's like the the gas giant of electronics. <laughs> Maybe not that. I don't know. Just a, he's the center of gravity. You know, you uh, you, you set out like, I'm not going to go to Anastasia Spice's channel because I'm sure I could find this information elsewhere. And you're like, no, no one's covering it. And then you start going, and it's like, maybe I'll check YouTube. And you're like, man, he does cover this exact subject. And boom, you're watching it. Like, there's no way to avoid it. So you might as well just, um, you might as well just check out his channel because um, he's the guy with the Swiss accent. He even yeah. has a, like a brand that I can remember. Like I will wake <laughs> up sometimes like thinking about his videos. Um, we need a brand like that. We yeah, are the seriously. guys with the uh, cat-shaped boards, I guess. Yeah, I'm gonna bring it up on my we screen because like I, I feel like I need to. So Andreas Spice also has like a secret like dark Andreas Spice yeah, channel where he goes over stuff that like might technically be illegal in your country. <laughs> so if you've never seen this YouTube channel, I honestly have no idea how this guy doesn't have more subscribers than us because he knows more about electronics than I think I will ever know in my entire life. Something about like something about his brain is able to focus on all the things I find so boring but I'm super interested in the result about that he can turn around and make a YouTube video and I feel like I understand it or at least I know that my idea is just not going to happen and why. So frequently I'll have an idea for a bonkers uh, just like electronics project and I'll be able to find out that it's either going to work or not going to work by just watching one of these videos and learning. So if you're into electronics projects and you want to see someone need very scientifically test out different types of batteries, different types of sensors. This one is a bunch of microphones. Um, all these different things for lower po low power projects, new microcontrollers compared against each other for speed. Like he does everything. It's wild. So I would say this is probably one of my favorite YouTube channels for like hacker like hacker stuff. It might not technically be about like you know like software hacking, but it's hardware hacking at its finest, and I really really like these videos. Yeah, it's almost always my go-to when I have some random thought or question about like the ESP thirty two S two while designing circuit boards or like the eighty two sixty six. Like one time, I was just like pondering if you could do like Wi-Fi triangulation and do like a range test on like how far could you actually do this with um, the ESP eighty two sixty six. And sure enough, the first thing that came up yeah. when I looked it up, just this guy. Yeah, doing it it's super like scientifically, there. very diligently, and recording the results in a way that's like kind of fun to watch. Like honestly, like I think he's great. And then if you want to take a peek at the dark side, you cut away too soon. Uh, you can scroll down, and when the hat comes off, the fun goes on. Oh gosh! Boom! This is his. This is his. No, other that is channel. not him. It sure is. Yeah, this is this is uh, his other channel <laughs> where he talks about all sorts of other cool stuff. So two really cool channels, and this one you know only has fifteen thousand subscribers. Wild! Get in before Dang. it blows up. Um, because this channel's great. But um, yeah, I love it. This this is uh, by far one of would be one of the best collaborations. Maybe sending him a Wi-Fi nugget once we get the surface mount version um, put together. Yeah, that'd be real cool. Hopefully he doesn't break it. <laughs> <laughs> Have to make sure he keeps the hat on for that, and he doesn't accidentally you know do a video on how to destroy the nugget. Someone asks about the intensity of the latest Linux exploit, which I think is in reference to Nimbus Pwn versus the Mad Cow exploit from 2016. I don't know too much about the Mad Cow exploit, but I know that they work off the same fundament, which is a symlink race issue. We actually covered this in last week's news stream, and I honestly forgot a little bit about it, but the way it works is um, a program essentially will create like a temporary log file, but if an attacker is able to create a symbolic link to this log file first when the operating system checks for the existence of, existence of this file. Um, if it's pointing to a legitimate directory, the attacker can attempt to change the link of the symbolic link as it's like doing that check. And the reason why it's called a race is because the attacker has to get it to change the location that it's pointing to in the amount of time that this check is happening. And then subsequently point this to a malicious file that might load malware into the previous file or use it to exfiltrate other program calls or stuff like that to um, do bad stuff. But from what I understand, this new exploit isn't um, necessarily as 
easy to exploit as the Mad Cow one was. Um, the attack chain seems a little bit hard to follow and replicate. And um, from the proof of concept, it also seems like they had to run the attack multiple times to get it to be successful. But nevertheless, it's out there. Um, proof of concepts exist, and it is within the realm of possibility that this could be exploited. But I don't think it's as bad as the unforgettable Mad Cow exploit from 2016. <laughs> yeah. We'll see how this turns out, though, um, in the near future. All right, so another Wi-Fi-related question. If the password is too strong, I would not be able to crack it, correct? Um, so if I disable the real access point by maybe like spamming it with the authentication frames or something, and I have my identical rogue uh, AP set up, uh, then the handshake is being uh, decrypted inside the router, right? Is there a way to get the hard-coded message via the AP hardware? Sorry if my question's confusing. So again, in this scenario, we're trying to get access to a Wi-Fi network, and the way we're gonna do that is by attacking clients um, that, are, that are also connected to that target access point by kicking them off and creating what looks like the router going through an update and making a open access point with the same name. Now, really, this relies on somebody not knowing how the router works, or at least just being willing to accept a plausible scenario when it's presented to them. So in this case, it's also important to note that there's a difference between like the, the brute forcing attack. When we're not getting an encrypted version, we're getting a hashed version. So that means we're not actually storing data here. It's just a number that when we feed this particular password into this process, that exact number comes out. And that that's the only time that that will happen. So if we try a whole bunch of passwords through this little this little like you know contraption of math, and we get that exact number again, then it means we found the right password. But it's not stored inside there. So that's one important distinction. So in the phishing attack, we are going after the plain text password. So we're basically popping up a web form that it does a like a captive portal. Like every time you go to maybe a hotel or something, and it asks you to agree to the terms of service. We're popping it up like that and making them think that the router is doing an update. So in plain text, they're just typing in their password. So there's no encryption, no hiding of any sort. We're really just taking it like we're giving them a web form to fill out, like, hi, please give me your password. And they're just like, yeah, sure. And they just type it in and press OK. Of course, we're creating the context by kicking them off and then stopping the attack as soon as they submit the right password. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, do we have any questions from the videos, too? Oh, sure. Yeah, I don't want to forget those. Let me see. Oh, someone says, yawn. Wi-Fi hacking is dead. Why talk about it? <laughs> Wi-Fi hacking you know? is not dead. Wi-Fi hacking is fun. <laughs> Between the pixie dust attack, all the like phishing attacks you can do now with micro microcontrollers that are like really easy to pull off, and the fact that a lot of people pick bad passwords, like we noticed that like, why do restaurants always pick like the phone number or the address? Like it just happens a lot. Heck, it's even like most people too. Most people are just like complacent about also changing default credentials on their router, so it'll just be like the default setup, which is like a combination of like nouns, adjectives, and three numbers, which is like most of the routers that I've encountered. Yeah, and also it's like, okay, cool. You set your Wi-Fi password to something really, really secure, but if I'm trying to hack your device and you've connected to like Google Starbucks and you haven't gone through and like deleted that from your phone, I can just pop up a Google Starbucks network and your phone will automatic, automatically connect to it if it thinks the signal's stronger. So yeah. like, there's a lot of different ways that Wi-Fi hacking is not dead, and you can still attack devices using Wi-Fi in all sorts of creative ways. Yeah, Wi-Fi hacking is <clears throat> definitely still relevant. Even with um, the advent of WPA3, there's still ways to exploit that, although um, it is a little bit harder. Yeah, I mean, it's getting harder to run some of these tools, and Wi-Fi security is getting better. So, for example, the WPS Pixie attack is no longer usually going to work against a router um, that was supplied by an internet service provider within the last couple of years. So, uh, Just a random Wi-Fi-related question on... Looks like a stream you did on um, Security Forward a while back. Wireshark basics for Wi-Fi hacking. Oh, uh, yeah. How did you get the password.txt file? I'm assuming that's a password list. I made it. Yeah, so also if you want to start out with passwords um, and trying brute forcing, <coughs> my advice is you should always use a password list that is derived from real password breaches. Um, statistically, people just reuse passwords and people are also not that creative. So if you're looking for a bunch of disgusting swear word passwords, you should look no further than real data breaches that have been compiled into password lists that honestly, if your target is not creative, if they're lazy, or if they've been using this for a very long time, maybe their Xbox account got popped in you know 2011 and they're still using the same password in their Wi-Fi because they think nobody will make the connection. Well, if that password has been breached and compiled into a password list, then guess what? You know, most hackers can just go on GitHub and find one of these repositories that has these uh, passwords lists. This one's lists. one of my favorites. Oh, uh, yes, like like this list yeah. right here. This one's one of the <coughs> most um, 
well-known list. It's called Security Lists by Daniel Messler. Uh, we can drop a link to that in the chat. Or you but, can just Google it, honestly, because yeah. it's super easy to find. This isn't forbidden knowledge, anyway, everyone. Uh, this is data that's been out there for a long time. So you really do need to make sure you're not using any of these passwords on any of your stuff, because like you know, they could be downloaded for free on the internet by a child. Yeah. And speaking hey, of, there was a question asked, a asked if you're 15. No, he's not. I am a. I'm a grown child. I am a child. <laughs> no longer am I a man. No. Am I a child man or a man child? Uh, I, I think a you're a child, child man. man. Yeah. <laughs> There's a distinction. <laughs> oh, yeah. But anyways, what's great about this repository, there's all sorts of different combinations of password lists. You have like the most common passwords from different data leaks. You can sort by the top 10,000, 100,000, top 1 million probable word lists, German word lists, basically every concoction of random words you can think of. Um, and it's really well put together. It's a great resource. Um, someone says, um, can you attack the web interface of a router using brute force uh, via a wasp zap? And didn't they make a video on that? Well, yeah. So um, PortSwigger actually has some free labs up that are vulnerable web applications that you can attack using Burp Suite, which has rate limiting on their free version, which make these attacks go very slow. Or, bizarrely, you could use the completely free and unlimited OWASP Zap, which I happen to make a video on doing exactly that. So if you want to learn how to do things like password brute forcing, because a lot of these IoT devices and a lot of networking devices use default credentials or credentials that are short or not very creative. And they do, don't often have a lot of brute force protection. And even if they do, there's ways of getting around this. So um, I made a couple different videos on some of my favorite ways. Some of them include hitting things that don't have brute force protection, like trying to use a stay logged in cookie in order to get to a restricted page without actually going through the login process, which invalidates a lot of, a lot of the protection you might put up on something like a router. Um, all of these things are very sneaky ways of getting around the kinds of broken protection that might be implemented on an old router that hasn't been updated in a long time and could allow you to get in via an authentication problem, which is my personal favorite way of breaking into uh, web applications. I just think it's funny when they give you the password. Um, so there's, yeah, I would say definitely check out PortSwigger if you want to try this out on some web applications that mimic, for example, the login page for a router that might have some sort of vulnerability. And I covered a couple of these on Hack5, and frankly, I love a Wasp Zap. It's super cool, and I think that you'll probably like it a lot too um, with these free targets. And of course, you can turn it against your own router and go crazy. Um, I found that sometimes this works really well, and sometimes it's just so, the router itself is so slow that making these requests would just like take quite some time. But yes, it's definitely possible. And in fact, like that's a great way to break into a router. Um, the only other way that I know is using command line tools that mimic things like a uh, Metasploit. Um, in this case, router exploit. I got to use that like once. It was pretty cool. It's super cool. I went to um, an observatory that overlooks Los Angeles that will remain unnamed and found out when connecting to the guest uh, network and just casually running a scan on router exploit that like, in fact, they have lots of default credentials and some very serious things oh they need to fix. So I let them know. But it always comes in handy if you have a tool like this to just, you know, check to see if anything around you might be vulnerable to anything in particular and then just let the person in charge know. So um, still lots of useful ways to check uh, if a router has a vulnerability. But I would say OWASP Zap is probably one of the more fun when it comes to poking around and trying stuff. Hate to get all political, but which one do you prefer? KDE, GNOME, XFCE, Ooh, or you're LTE? You're trying to start a fight. Why is this person trying to start a fight? <laughs> At least they're not asking about Linux distros, which is like astrology, but for nerds. Um, I prefer GNOME, just because it's the default on like the two operating systems I've used, which is <clears throat> Ubuntu and Kali. I just find it smooth. The icons are all big and nice. And um, the animations are honestly pretty cool when you like switch tabs or whatever. Like, looks real cute. How about you, Cody? Nano, moving on. Okay, God. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just lumping this in my head into the same debate as that. Um, so also, James mentions you could probably identify someone based on their uh, crappy but unique passwords if you used a breach password list on their Wi-Fi and got lucky. So that's actually super true. My, my most... Um, Sh like shocked or just disappointed moment was when I did the the uh, hate mail video for Nullbyte. So that is a huge um, associated like database where different people's email addresses are tied to accounts where there's password breaches. So you can go back and you can see your parents' passwords. Mm -hmm. And my mom had some terrible, terrible passwords. So you can find your family, friends, like lots of people are in this giant index sorted and uh, released 
password breach. And um, yeah, I could see that my mom had a, a, a password of, of swears, as it were. Uh, and <laughs> nice. that if I wanted to break into her account, I know that just... Um, just try different curse words. Try different curse through, words yeah. all kind of jumbled together. So yeah, you can build a profile on the way that somebody selects passwords by using something like hate mail in order to go through and look for previous databases that have all been indexed to that person's email address. So rather than just kind of spray and pray from a, a, you know, a billion breached password list, you can instead profile the specific user by just looking at their email address, which is not that hard to find with like people finder services nowadays. Kappa says, what's your opinion on tails? You know, tails are pretty call heads. freaky. Uh, I was going to talk what? about like prehensile tails on mammals and how they have evolved. Yeah, as a I think we're going to I think we're going to switch this, this to balance question. them, but they're effective, and I think they're a cool um, adaptation. Involvement. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, um, that's all. We'll consider putting a tail on the nugget. <laughs> Thanks for the question. All yeah. right. Next. Um, I'm actually going to pull up a question from, from the video, please. Videos, yeah. yeah. Someone asks, "How do you discover hidden Wi-Fi?" Ah, uh, hidden Wi-Fi networks are a scourge. Um, and I'm sorry also to the person who asked about tails. Like, I just don't know that much about it. I'm not being flippant. <laughs> I literally, like, oh, I would just be just making stuff up. So I think tails is cool. I don't personally use it. I, we, did a, we did a video on it um, on Security Forward where we have someone who does use it and have lots of opinions on it. So if you want to check out ta tails, check out the Security Forward channel where we did a great video on it. And I, I think it was James that did it. Um, so hidden Wi-Fi networks. So people think that if they hide their Wi-Fi network, it makes them secret and cool and that nobody will be able to see or attack their Wi-Fi network, but it's untrue. Instead, you're basically like branding your phone with the name of that Wi-Fi network and making it call out that network name in plain text over and over and over all of the time. So your phone has like all this like science and math going on inside of it to try to protect you from tracking. So it's like changing its MAC address when you're not connected to a Wi-Fi network. And sometimes it'll even change its whole MAC address if you connect to a different Wi-Fi network, all to like throw off advertisers that are trying desperately to piece together information and track you. So if you connect to a hidden Wi-Fi network, guess what your phone does? It has no idea whether or not that network is near. Why? Because it's hidden. So it's not broadcasting its name. So your phone has to assume that that network could be nearby at any moment. And what that means is that it's constantly screaming out that name, being like, hello, are you here? Hello, can I connect? So everywhere you're, go you're going, your phone is putting out a super recognizable request, trying to look for this very unique network name, which means you are super trackable everywhere you go. And it's very easy for advertisers or anybody else to track you everywhere. So if you have connected to a hidden network, you should delete it from your phone and you shouldn't use hidden networks because they are a privacy nightmare. And they are, I think that their name is like so ironic because from the client side of like your mobile device or your laptop, you're actually just making it scream this super recognizable thing all the time and making it so people can track you. Don't use hidden networks. I think they're hilarious. Now, how can you discover hidden networks? Well, they're not broadcasting. So you need to have a device that's connected to it. And if you kick them off of the network, um, in the first part of that negotiation, um, they need to exchange the network name as part of that and you are able to actually see what that is. So you can t usually see a uh, hidden network as soon as a client connects to it or by kicking off a client via deauthentication. Those are the two fastest ways of doing it. There might be some other uh, ways that are a little sneakier, but those are the by far the fastest. Solid. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna pull up some more questions from our old videos. We have some remarks on, is your neighbor's video doorbell listening to you? Which is quite a freaky piece. Someone says, I would like to see more flaws mm. in ways in which you can access IP cameras and video doorbells. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we were actually talking about doing a video on smart cameras and how freaky they are. We also did a video on discovering hidden cameras, which is tangentially related. Uh, yes. Those are kind of scary. Yeah, yeah. But so. Um, yeah, I'm gonna punt that one, but I will say, like, check out our video on using Wireshark to find yeah. hidden cameras. <laughs> all right, all right. Next question. Uh, someone says, "Can we get the title of the codes and book in the background, please?" On a really old video we did. So oh. this is hacking computers from blocks away with a Wi-Fi duck. I believe that's your cryptography book, right? Or um, something of that sort. Let me try googling it. Um, yeah. So for context. I think this was shot in a different studio, and there was a there was a bookshelf in the background. And um, wait, I think we have it actually in the studio. It's in here somewhere. somewhere. Yeah, I, it's so, actually right over there. Oh my gosh, get it. Sure. All right, all right. So yeah, we. <laughs> <clears throat> 
You are so lucky I'm because I actually have no idea what the title of this is. It's like cryptography, the history <laughs> of something. That's hilarious. <laughs> that's not, that's that's not it, is it? I know I've seen it around here. Um, yeah. I'll to you guys, but um, yeah, read books, kids. Go to school. You should definitely go to knowledge. school. Yeah, that's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and say you should definitely go to school. Books are good. Um, oh, oh, okay. So if we switch to my screen, the first Dang. one is uh, like one of the code books that I have. I'm not sure if it's the green one you were asking for, but this is the companion book and it's also great. The code book, The Science of Secrecy from Ancient Egypt to whatever. I think like World War II or something. I've seen you with that one around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like my mini one, but I also have like a fat green one that's also really good that unfortunately is not any of these. So that book is highly classified and will remain a mystery and that is my decision because I can't Knowledge find it. Knowledge is vast. Yes, 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 yes. Dissolve. All right, next question. Um, all right, all right, all right. I'm on the spot here. Oh yeah, someone asked for some good resources for getting started with hacking. One of the ones that I usually point them to is one that I started out with, which is actually a GitHub repository that's a compilation of various resources that point you to learning about different hacking techniques, different um, books you can read, different references for like API documentation and stuff like that. I wanna see if I can actually pull that up. Um, I forget what it's called but I will drop that in the chat momentarily. Cool. And stall on that question for just a <laughs> second. Do you see any question? I'm Ah, here it is, it. okay. If you wanna switch over to my screen real quick, I can go through this for a second. So it's literally called Awesome Ethical Hacking Resources. Oh, good. Yeah, so you can see there's some book references. Um, there's the OWASP Zap Testing Guide, Web Hacking, Social Engineering, some good stuff there. Um, a general outline of different online resources that you can use, so like CTFs and different vulnerable web applications that you can use to test out your skills. <coughs> like you can see some popular ones, Try Hack Me, Hack the Box. Um, I think I just saw, uh, what should, what should we call it? Not OWASP Zap, Burp Suite is on there. Um, some offline ones you can practice with, different vulnerable databases. Um, links to password lists, different courses you can take, and some other really great online resources. So I found this really useful when I was getting started, and this pointed me to a lot of really great resources. So I'll drop that in the chat. Um, this is a question that I, I'm going to caution Alex against fully answering. How often do you guys do casual pen tests on public Wi-Fi? <laughs> so it's important to talk about the difference Fine. between uh, things you are allowed to do uh, casually and things you are not allowed to do. So an example of something you might be allowed to do is if you, you know, go to a coffee shop and then you're given, or they have an open Wi-Fi network, there's no password on it. And then on that network, there's, I don't know, like a, a Spotify system that does not require password in order for you to play a song. And you happen to have the app and without any sort of authentication, it, you know, detects that other Spotify speaker, um, you know, on the, the system and is able to stream to it. Uh, and then you change the song and nobody likes it. But that's, is that a crime? Well, I mean, technically you're poking it's around. It's a favor. A, like, it very well, depending on the vibe, could be a favor. Um, but I mean, arguably you're messing around with stuff that you're not supposed to, but there was no authentication. It was left wide open and you were using like the front door, as it were, an application that's meant to interact with that program and it was not set up to be secure. So that sort of thing, like visiting the router page and seeing what's going on or if there's any settings visible, that sort of, <clears throat> that's sort of just like checking it out that is probably fine. No passwords are exchanged, you are not damaging anything, and you're not accessing something that has authentication preventing you from getting in. Now, what if the printer doesn't have a password, and you connect to it, and you print off a bunch of documents and destroy the digital screen? Completely possible to do that. Um, that is a crime in two different ways. For one, you bust it in through you know, the, the authentication. So even if it had a default password on it, even if that default password was listed on the page, it doesn't mean that you're allowed to log into that part. So after that, if you were to waste resources or you know, otherwise damage a piece of equipment potentially, that would be something where you could get in a lot of trouble. So while we do you know, maybe change the song in coffee shops occasionally, um, we definitely don't go through and do things like damage equipment or you try to log into something that has a password protected interface um, because that is where you can start to get in trouble. So that's yep. kind of the line. If you are curious, um, I feel like I really threaded the needle on that one. 
Um, but again, Don't everybody has their own definition of what is and isn't authorized. Uh, that's my personal definition of what I would be comfortable of, and I tend to be kind of conservative when it comes to like risk in that sort of regard. Um, but if you have your own definition for when it becomes not okay to touch something on a network that has you know no authentication, yeah, drop it in the comments. And also, we're coming up on our time, so if you have a burning question, make sure that you drop it in the chat so we can answer it in these last couple minutes. <coughs> or if you're watching this on repeat, you can always leave them on the channel, and we will get to them next week. I see two good questions. Someone says, I have a small suggestion for the Wi-Fi Pineapple. Ah. A module for mapping Wi-Fi networks you pass by, kind of like Wiggle Wi-Fi Map. Yeah, hmm. so on the last Q&A stream we did last week, Darren actually showed off how you can run Kismet on the Wi-Fi Pineapple um, via the new web interface. So since this technically is just a tiny old computer box here <laughs> <laughs> with some custom firmware on it, you can run basically any Linux utility. So um, yeah, you can install Kismet um, via command line. Actually, no, it's not the command line version anymore. It's the web interface. Web interface. Yeah, but you can use that for war driving, and you can upload that data set to Wiggle. I don't know about like a locally hosted Wiggle, but there is a way to import the, I believe it's the KSV, not CSV. There's a different file format that works with Google Maps. Hmm. So you can directly import that into um, mymaps.google.com, and you can visualize your data set um, locally. Although you can also just upload whatever data you pull um, to the Wiggle database. Mm. There are some good questions. So we get the laptop question a lot. Um, what laptop are we using? I'm using a company-issued MacBook Pro. And Alex? I'm using a Cody-issued um, <laughs> Lenovo ThinkPad. I broke my ThinkPad, which is actually just dismembered. <laughs> and yeah, it's. It's been through quite a lot of abuse. Four years of high school, various staircases that it's met in its lifetime, and also um, other traumatic experiences through me flipping it around like this. Yeah. So this thing has seen some stuff. It has, and I don't think it can recover from those experiences. No. Um, someone else asks, uh, how difficult is it to detect sniffing on a network? It depends on its if it's active or passive reconna reconnaissance. If it's passive reconnaissance, it's impossible because they're not emitting any signals, they're just listening. If it's active reconnaissance, like they're acting as a man in the middle, or if they're doing something like they're doing ARP scans or like doing network scans, then it becomes a lot easier for you to detect that sort of activity because it's active. But really, that's the break point, <laughs> active versus passive. Um, if they're doing passive sniffing, you're not going to detect them because how would you? They wouldn't even be on your network. <clears throat> right, they're just on the outside looking in. Yeah, and if they know your password, they can decrypt your traffic and just be completely unassociated to your network, just watching everything go by. It's awesome. It's also one of the nice features of the pineapple. You can toggle between like active or passive attacks slash sniffing and reconnaissance, depending on how low of a profile you want to keep during an engagement. Uh, this is a good question. I learned programming for the sciences. That helped me when I started to become interested in security, but it didn't seem completely necessary. How important is coding virtuously for security? Um, I would say, honestly, if you don't know how to program, it shouldn't prevent you from getting into security because if you can learn how to use Metasploit or like other modules, like you can do most of the stuff you need to do for a pen test or other types of work without being a programmer. Um, so it's, a, it's better to know how technology works and how people work and how processes work than it is for you to know how to program something from scratch. It's just like, if you don't know how security works, then like you're a programmer, not a security person. But if you know how security works and you don't know how to program, you're still a security person, you know? So um, I would say it definitely enhances your ability to participate, build your own tools and make prototypes. And nowadays also do like electronics stuff um, because you can really take things like Python and then carry that experience over to all sorts of stuff that didn't used to be possible. So yeah, it, sup it supercharges your ability to participate, but it shouldn't prevent you uh, from being, you know, a cybersecurity person or working in cybersecurity. Yeah, I agree with that. Unless you're doing like- uh, The format is KML. Thank you, uh, Yeah, thank you. I forgot what I was going to say now, but I agree <laughs> with Cody. <laughs> I installed Kismet on my Mark 7 v2.0 beta and saw dependencies for RTL SDR. That's actually interesting. I haven't seen that yet. Can I plug in my new Elec Nano 3 into my Pineapple? Probably, yeah. Uh, we do have a new Elec, and I've used it with um, I've used it with the Raspberry Pi, which is also a embedded Linux device. So. You probably sh would be able to do that on a Wi-Fi pineapple. <clears throat> and I might try that, because that sounds cool. Yeah, it does sound cool. Um, how often do you get to perform pen tests? Virtually never, because we make content all the time. 
we're always making content. You guys might have noticed that. I've been doing that for several years now. So um, we don't get to do pen tests very often. It's usually only if we go to like a conference or like if we're part of something else that we get to like attack other people's stuff. So not often enough. We have to do like kind of self-training in order to stay current with stuff. Someone asks, is Google dorking legal? Depends on where you live. Um, if you live in the United States, Google dorking is usually legal, provided that you're not authenticating to something. Um, it's arguable if there's like an authentication string that includes a password. Is that an authentication? Did you type in a password? Did you just find a link that's public? Like, if you're doing it in certain states, it seems that like they'll try to prosecute you um, because oh. that was in the news not that long ago. Was that that HTML thing or a different? Yeah, issue? it was like the HTML thing. So, so like viewing the source code could get you in trouble in certain states. So if you're if you're walking on a, like a thin line, like be very careful because there's a lot of people who do not know the difference and are willing to uh, yeah throw the full weight of the law against you because they don't get it. Okay. Someone asked. Someone actually <coughs> asked the question on our old Google dorking video. Can anyone tell me what plugins they are using? Do you happen to remember them off the top of your head? Um, for dorking? Yeah. I, I, no, I don't. Sure. Not off the top of my we head, remember sorry. in the future, we'll let you know. <laughs> um, any ETA on rubber duckies being back in stock? I don't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I feel like I heard something about more of them being in stock at some point. But as an alternative, you could, of course, check out the Wi-Fi Nugget, which deploys um, you know, the same payload that the Wi-Fi Ducky does, hey, um, if a bit more stylishly, I might say. But uh, yeah, I, I believe that they are going to restock them at some point. I just don't know when. Sorry. All right, so I think that that's just about the time we have. Oh, we're actually a couple minutes over. So if you have a burning question, make sure to drop it in the chat. And also a big shout out to Veronis for sponsoring this and letting us hang out with you guys once a week. It is through them that we get to bring this content to you. So uh, make sure to check them out and check out our other channel, Security Forward, that's Security FWD, if you want to support us and also see our Friday news stream where if you had a question about current events, we're probably going to answer it there. So if you're curious about this new Linux exploit or any of the other hacking news of the week, make sure to check out the Security Forward channel where we do our Friday streams covering that. So with that, I think that that's all we have time for today. I want to thank Zam for keeping the peace and everybody else in the chat for asking some excellent questions, especially the Wi-Fi hacking nerd questions. You guys are great. If you have any other hard ones, like feel free to send them to me because I will look them up and check in with the experts I know to answer them beforehand. Because like those are the questions you know I really feel like I can't mess up as like a Wi-Fi hacking expert. So. Thank you very much to everybody uh, who's with us live and to everybody who is hopefully going to leave an excellent question in the comments below, and we'll see you next time.